This lesson is an introduction to the example modules I developed for this course. I wanted to give you a feel for the design of such modules. Also, I use these modules as a way to show you some other aspects of embedded development, such as interrupt handlers and state machines. In addition, if you are still learning C, I would suggest to read the code of these modules and try to figure out how they work and exactly what each line of code does. Reading code is a skill everyone in software development needs. Now the lesson starts with a brief descrip description of the modules. Then we integrate the source code of the modules and the superloop into the IDE project. Finally, we build the code and verify it runs on the board. Now following this lesson, there is a series of lessons that looks at each of these example modules one at a time. On this slide, I list the course example modules. I will briefly go through them and describe what they do. For some modules, I list in green text some technical things about the implementation that I think would be important to learn about. First, I have a number of infrastructure modules, meaning they provide general functionality that is independent of the application. I think these could be used as the start for a platform for many bare metal embedded applications. Probably the most useful module and the most complex is TTYS. It provides an abstraction of a serial port or UART and is integrated into the C language standard um, IO API. In short, this module lets you do things like printf to a serial port. At the implementation level, the TTYS module includes real examples of important topics like overriding weak symbols and interrupt handler and circular buffers. The console module builds on TTYS and gives you a console with a prompt. At the implementation level, the console module includes what is known as a line discipline. We'll see what that is in the lesson on this module. The command module makes it easy to add console commands. Console commands can be very important for your system, and so we want to make it easy to add them. The timer module provides software-based timers. The resolution is not super fine, just one millisecond, but this is sufficient for many timing needs. The log module is a simple system to log messages to the console, normally for testing and debugging. The DIO module is an abstraction for discrete I.O. It is really just a thin layer to isolate your application from the hardware. But like many, app, but like many modules, it provides some console commands for testing and debugging. The MEM module just provides some console commands that allow you to read and write memory, like a debugger would. It is obviously used for testing and debugging. These infrastructure modules form the start of a platform. The demo modules, on the other hand, actually do something unique using that platform. I'm afraid they're not terribly interesting, but they are something. The Blinky module blinks an LED. No surprise there. I chose to do this because this is what people often do when starting in Embedded. But this is a much fancier version of, of Blinky than what is normally done. At the implementation the, uh, level, the Blinky module uses a simple state machine. And finally, the uh, GPS GTU7 module um, it is a little more interesting than Blinky. It interfaces to a cheap GPS module I found on the web. And to put all this together, I include a file that contains the top level function that initializes and starts the modules and then runs the superloop. Without a superloop, we won't have much of a demo. This diagram shows the dependencies between modules. And the way this works is, if there's an arrow, say, from console to TTYS, it means that the console module is dependent upon or makes use of TTYS. So if you look at this diagram, one thing you'll see is that a lot of modules depend on uh, command. And 
That's because if you remember, command is used to add console commands to the system. And m almost all of these modules add uh, console commands to the system. Now these dependencies really aren't that important. I just want you to see how modules can build on top of each other. So there's some notes here. One is the log module is not shown because almost everyone uses it. There's no point in, in putting it up there. Um, another thing is that the application isn't shown here. The application includes a super loop. Um, it also accesses nearly every module, so there's no point in showing it. And then this final note is more interesting. Modules with a blue background use the LL device driver library. And so that means if you ported this code to a, another MCU, another type of system, these are the modules that might require some rework because the hardware interface might be different. On the other hand, all of these white modules should require little, if any, re rework. Uh, they're independent of the hardware. And this is sort of the value of having these modules like DIO that provide hardware abstraction. Next, we need, need to integrate the example code into the IDE project. Here's a list of tasks uh, to do this. I will go through some of these in detail in slides coming up. Now, first you need to download the um, code from GitHub. And there are different ways of doing this, and I'll let you figure that out. There's lots of web resources. By the way, you can download it on your PC wherever you want. I suggest you don't download it into your IDE project folder, but you can if you want. Um, just by the way, here is the, um, uh, the URL for the uh, GitHub repo. And th so after you download it, there should be somewhere on your system a folder called MCU Class 1 Code, um, and you'll need that in one of these um, tasks. So um, if you have the code downloaded, the next thing you could do is uh, check if the device configuration is correct for the course project. Now, we actually already did this, I believe, in the lesson on um, looking at startup code. So it might already be correct, but in case you skip some stuff, um, you have to ensure or enable UART 6, uh, making it asynchronous 9600 baud. Uh, this is for the GPS module. Even if you don't um, have that module, um, I suggest you turn it on. It might be needed to make the code build correctly. And just to make it clear, USART 2 uh, continues to be used for the console, so don't, uh, don't you know, turn that off. Um, the other thing is, after you do this, after you add the U USART, um, make sure all devices are set up to use the LL device driver library. And finally, if you do change things, you have, you'll have to regenerate the code. Um, after that, we set up the IDE project so it finds the example uh, code files. We essentially import it. After that, we also have to set up the IDE project so it finds the header files, uh, include files, and, or aka the .h files. Um, these are not difficult. Um, then we have to go into the IDE generated code. Uh, there's two files, one of them is main.c, and we have to add a couple hooks from that generated code into the example code. Um, I don't like to make changes to generated code, and in this case there are, there are just these two changes. I think it's a total of four lines. Um, then if it's not already done, we need to hook up the console serial port. Um, we've done that in a previous lesson. And finally, build the project and run it. And that was also done in a previous lesson, I think the Hello World lesson. So this is not really that complicated. It's a lot of things, but they're, they're not difficult. Um, don't be surprised if you get some build errors the first time, particularly if somehow the, the code doesn't get linked in properly. All I can say is, Try to read the error message and think about what's going on and, uh, and then just check your work. So at this point, 
I assume you've downloaded the example code to your computer somewhere and have checked the device configuration in the IDE um, if you need to. So we now need to integrate the example code into the IDE project. And what I suggest we do is link, not copy, the example code into the IDE uh, project workspace. I do this because I like to keep my world of code separate from the IDE world of generated code. And one thing this does, if I mess up my IDE project folder, it shouldn't affect uh, my code. So anyhow, here are the tasks um, to link in the module code and the application code. I'm not going to go through this text in detail. I suggest, if you'd like, you can pause the video here. On the next couple slides, I have some screenshots that um, sort of show this. So here's a screenshot of integrating the modules. And this is when you have done the link folder uh, step and you get this pop-up and so we're creating a folder called modules in the IDE workspace and it's being linked to this folder um, which is where the code is downloaded. Of course this path will be different for your computer but this last part I think should be the same. So that's for the modules folder. This is for the app folder. The Folder name in the works IDE workspace will be called app. It's actually called app1 in the uh, example code. But that's that. And then the final thing I want to show you, after you've done this, if you go in, look to the Project Explorer on the left side of the IDE, you should see the app and modules folders. And if you uh, expand them under app, you should see this file here. It contains the uh, super loop. And under modules, you'll see a, a number of folders for the different modules. Now we need to tell the IDE uh, project where the module header files are. This information is needed by the C compiler, and the IDE will update the make files with this information. Now the procedure is similar to what we did to link in the code. Uh, again, it's through project settings. And I will uh, let you read through this, and I will just um, wait for a second in case you want to pause the video. So here is a screenshot of uh, sort of the final step of doing this. And uh, we went into the Includes tab, if you can see that. We added a directory path. Um, we are now specifying a directory within the IDE uh, workspace. So here's the modules folder we just created and we're selecting the include directory. And we check all of these boxes, um, they all apply. Uh, some like add to all languages isn't that critical, but it doesn't hurt anything just to uh, check them all. And you apply this and uh, that's it. So. This has taken care of integrating the code um, and pointing where the uh, include directory is. Um, now there's one more thing we have to do before we can build it. That last step is to add hooks in the IDE generated code to point to the example code. There are two places we have to do this. The first hook is uh, to call our uh, app underscore main function in, um, from the generated main function. The main.c file is in the IDE under course source. So you go to that file and edit it. Uh, the first change is approximately line 54. And in here, we're just declaring uh, app underscore main. There's no header file for app uh, underscore main. It, I didn't think it was worth it, so we just declare the function. And then in the while loop, the infinite loop at the bottom of um, the main function, 
we simply call app underscore main. This function has the super loop in it and it will never return. So going to the next hook, this is a hook to uh, the timer module and in particular to call timer sysTick handler from the generated code sysTick handler and that generated code is in this file core source uh, STM32. I'll let you read this. So in this case um, we, there is a header file for the timer module. We include that here and then in the sysTick handler we just put our hook right there. So again these line numbers may vary. So that is the extent of the changes we have to make. If we ever regenerate code, which includes regenerating these files, the IDE should carry forward these changes. Um, it has been known that you lose them in, in some cases, but it really should carry them forward. Okay, we're almost there. We need to hook up the console and start a terminal program like PuTTY, uh, like we did in a previous lesson. Then from the IDE, uh, we build the code and run it on the board like we did before. This is the big step to see if the build works. Keep in mind if the build does work, say, and you do a debug rather than, than a run, the MCU will stop at the start of the main function and you'll have to do a continue from there. Now on the system console, in other words the PuTTY window, you should see some initialization messages and a console prompt. So here is a screenshot of my console and uh, at least at this point in time what you'll see is these three uh, init messages. Hopefully you see no errors. Uh, just the stages of initialization. Initi initializing the module, starting the modules, and then entering the super loop. If you do see this, and then you'll see the console prompt, uh, enter help, and you'll get a summary of all of the uh, mess, all of the console commands you can run, and you'll notice the uh, the first uh, part of the command is the name of the module. And if you look at the board, you should also see the LED blinking a pattern. We'll learn about what that pattern. Uh, actually means or what it's doing in the lesson on Blinky. So that's it. I hope your system is running and um, once again thanks for watching.